How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Virtual History 360. I'm Mr. Wade, and today I have the special honor to introduce a teacher that I followed on YouTube for years, none other than Mr. Beat. He is a high school social studies teacher from Kansas, and his videos, if you have not seen them, are top notch. Let me tell you, if you are not subscribed, you need to do that right away because you will learn more than you could ever imagine. So, without further ado, Mr. Beat, I will turn it over to you. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for saying that nice thing about me <laughs> and my channel. Thanks. I didn't know you've been watching for years. That's that's cool. Yeah, it was crazy to think. You know, I did. I started this channel back in 2016, and but I've been a teacher since 2008, and. You know. Oh yeah, I've been teaching since uh, 2009. So we, and uh, I started my channel. Let's see, 2011. So January 2011. So yeah, <laughs> it's crazy how time flies. You know, when you're talking about you know just every year. You know, it's funny people ask why do teachers do what they do. I go because I don't get bored because every year is different. But you know, every year we still teach yeah. the same curriculum. So yeah, trying to find you know in, you know different resources you know because they don't give me everything and I stumbled upon your channel and my goodness the you sum everything up in such a neat package that I can throw it in any part of class and it works perfectly so I want to thank you for that. Well, I used to teach middle school myself, so I can understand how you stumbled across my videos to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and I, before we begin, I want to say uh, when I first came across your channel, I was which was fairly recently actually like a few months ago i was like whoa this is awesome this is this is something i've been talking about for years doing and you were already doing it going to historical locations and getting taking the 360 camera out there that's totally one of the things i've wanted to do for a while so i'm glad to see you out there doing it it's really important yeah you know, i appreciate hearing that um you know it's a crazy how far technology has come when i first like heard about 360 cameras you had to buy like this ten thousand dollar 3d printed rig and then all of a sudden they came out with this handheld camera i'm like all right let's do it and you know i try and do my best with it hopefully i can take people where they've never thought to visit like i just did a um bull weevil monument in enterprise alabama which i saw that <laughs> you know, I learned about that when I was in college. I took a history of the South class, and the professor mentioned it. I was like, "What? There's a bowling <laughs> on it?" And I took a drive down to Alabama. I was like, "How often do you get to Alabama?" So I drove down there, and lo and behold, there is a statue in the middle of the main intersection. And you know, if you don't know and you can't find stuff, you know, maybe 360 videos will get you there. So that was my mm -hmm. hope. It's, if you can't actually visit the places in person, this is the next best thing, and especially good for for students that you know it's like going on a on a field trip, you know, just watching this video, putting the the three the sixty uh, goggles on or whatever they call it. Yeah, <laughs> those little headsets, they they really are fully headsets. I I call them virtual field trips. You know, I take my kids all the time. Like if we're talking about this place. You know, my favorite one to date was I used a just a still picture, but it was the shores of Tripoli. You know, we're talking about the Barbary Wars, mm. and I talked to kids about the Philadelphia running aground, and I was like, "We're because we live in Florida." I say, "You think of the beach? You think of that nice, smooth, flat sand?" And I go, "No, look at these rocks and these boulders that the ship ran into." And you know, just mind, you know, their eyes got so wide when we actually saw that. That's mm. why we, That's do awesome. what we do. All right, so you know, this is we could go on and on about random stuff, but I think you know what you want to talk about and what I want to get into are the Supreme Court cases because. You know, I know you teach uh, high school right now, and I'm in middle school, but Supreme Court cases, you know, outside of school are probably the most relevant thing to everyone these days, just because decisions passed set the precedent and, you know, set the tone for years to come. So there's been a number of cases, and, I mean, middle school has a smaller number, I'm sure, than what you go over, but the fact that we have, you know, these landmark Supreme Court cases that you know, span the decades, you know, being a former U.S. history teacher talking about the Civil War, you have Dred Scott, you know, that's a big deal, but that transitions mm -hmm. into Plessy, you know, so what Supreme Court cases, you know, really stand out to you? Like, what are your big ones? Well, I mean, the landmark cases for sure, because I have to teach them and <laughs> I teach government to, uh, to juniors and so in high school. So, uh, but yeah, obviously Marbury v. Madison is the the first one I start with because yeah. that's the one that established judicial review and you know it's not necessarily the most exciting story but we do uh, I have this uh, 
I found on this website called Teachers Pay Teachers, which I'm, I'm pretty sure you already know. You've probably been on that website many times. Oh, yeah. Uh, but they uh, they have these little plays that you can act out the Supreme Court cases, and they turn it into a narrative. And so that's one of the ones I do for that. It works really well. Um, and of course, uh, I made a video for that one. Most of these I made videos for already. Um, but one I have not made a, an updated video for. I made a video way back in the day, um, but just Plessy v. Ferguson is another one that uh, I think it's obviously a horrible decision, but it's uh, it shows you kind of the rationale. It kind of you kind of I think it's one of the best ways to learn about um, Jim Crow mm. is uh, by just looking at that one case. It really captures it all you know um, it's one of the cases where i tell my kids you know they don't always get it right you know they they can yeah. get it wrong and here's a clear example i think you know i was actually mm -hmm. in new orleans uh, about a year ago and we did a tour of the um st louis uh graveyard and they actually had you know you actually got to see homer plessy's grave you know his tomb oh wow and that was so cool and the guy that was leading us through the uh, graveyard explained that he became like a pariah in the community because everyone like hinged their hopes on you know all right you're gonna win this for us and he lost so you know he yeah. kind of became an outcast in the whole town really i didn't know about what happened afterwards so much um yeah and you know of course there's dread scott as well um the dreadful decision uh it still kind of blows my mind some of the i mean the supreme court is supposed to be some of the smartest people you know we've ever had lead our country and uh, you just read some of these quotes from not that long ago really and it's just like what were you thinking <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah the there were, speaking of bad decisions um a recent one that I just, my most recent episode of Supreme Court Briefs uh, is the case Kilo v. New London, which I think uh, almost universally is viewed as a, as a pretty bad decision that kind of stretched what eminent domain meant. Um, it, uh, do, are you familiar with Kilo versus New London? Not as familiar as you. You know, I know the name, but... yeah. Yeah, there's a movie called the Pink or called Little Pink House um, that just came out. What was it? A year and a half ago. But it's about the the case. The, it's a 2005 case where uh, a woman named Suzette Kilo uh, in, in uh, New London, Connecticut, and uh, the city and the state of Connecticut uh, forced them out so that they could build uh, this, you know, these fancy uh, apartments, these condos, and like, uh, you know, kind of an upscale area to be there to try to draw in workers at Pfizer. And Pfizer, it was all for Pfizer. It was just, it was just redevelopment for this private corporation. So most people kind of see that, yeah, that's kind of a, it's abusing eminent domain. You're, um, and, 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 and the sad thing is that they ended up having to leave anyway. And they lost the case. Um, and then if you go there today, in 2019, 14 years after the case, the land is still vacant. They never even developed it. And, and Pfizer ended up closing down and moving away. So it was a complete failure. And they, they were, they spent all this, all like tens of millions of dollars on, on this. And it was all for nothing. You, you so. know, change, you know, I get happens, but change for the sake of change with no real purpose makes no sense. And the fact that you're going to invest in, you know, one, fighting the case, and two, you know, literally destroying lives or kicking people out of their lives and then not mm -hmm. follow through with it, that's that's a rough one. Yeah, so a lot of bad decisions, but let's, let's be more positive here. So I think I had a couple other ones I was going to mention that were... Uh, decisions that I like that um, were good decisions. Um, let's see here on my list. I think one of my favorite all-time cases is Matt versus Ohio. Um, are you familiar with Matt versus Ohio? I am not. You have to help me out with that one. Okay, yeah. Um, so there's a woman named Dalry Mapp um, who is in uh, kind of the wrong place at the wrong time. The police knock on her door. They're looking for other stuff from 
but actually they're looking for an, a guy who was suspected of a uh, like terrorism <laughs> um, and they don't see they don't find him in the house uh, oh I should back up they, they break into the house essentially because she did not does not let them in she's like do you have a warrant and they like well no so they leave and they come back with a piece of paper that is uh, not a warrant but they said it was and so she but they broke in anyway and searched th through all of her stuff invaded her privacy and they found other items that just so happened to be technically illegal. Uh, there were magazines that were left in the house that she didn't even know were there that had um, naked pictures on them. <laughs> no other way to put it. And so uh, that was why she got, they, they arrested her for that. And so she fought it. Um, and yeah, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And she won the case on the fact that it, they, the, the Supreme Court ruled that the police that day had went against the Fourth Amendment. Um, they had to have a, I mean, the, the warrant was, actually, they didn't have probable cause either, nor a warrant. So that was a big win for the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, that, that's a big one. And I, I, you know, you're telling this story and I'm like, oh my goodness, can you imagine just like me? Old, you know, it's like the old cartoons where they flash a fake police badge, you know, and just, yeah. just walked. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. I mean, uh, there's also another uh, case that I think is, has been more relevant lately because it keeps coming up in the news every few months because President Trump mentions it is uh, there's a case called U.S. v. Wong Kim Ark that is about um, citizenship, birthright right. citizenship. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the first time the Supreme Court just straight up said, it doesn't matter where you come from or whatever, whatever your parents are doing, if you are born in the United States, you are automatically a citizen. Yeah. Uh, and... It basically, I mean, that's in the 14th Amendment, but it wasn't, the court hadn't really, they were kind of like, eh, you know, they didn't really talk much about it until then. And that was in the 1890s. Uh, Kim, Wong Kim Ark was a, uh, he was the son of Chinese immigrants who, well, they had green cards. And so they had, they went back to China and, and he did too with them for a while, but then he came, tried to come back to the United States and that's when they held him and said, hold up, you know, you're not a citizen, and so he fought it. Yeah, that's one of so the big points that we, you know, drive to my middle school students is, you know, we talk about law of blood and law of soil, you know, just solely, or however you pronounce it, is, you know, if you're on American dirt, you get it, and, you know, that's one of the three big points, you know, naturalization, law of blood, law of soil, those are the three point, you know, three big points that we drive home with our middle schoolers. What was that last one you said? Uh, law of blood, law of soil, and then naturalization. Okay, law of soil. So, uh, th could you? I haven't heard this before. I, I love it though. What, what, could you uh, elaborate on law of soil? Well, it's essentially the same thing. If you're born on American property, or, you know, whether it be oh. a, like a military base, you know, uh, territory, or in the United States, you get American citizenship. So, exactly mm. that case. Okay. Yeah, all right. Florida yeah, and I, might, you know, change the vernacular a little bit, but I like it. I might steal that from my government go. classes. <laughs> That's what teachers do, right? We steal each other's stuff. Oh, see, now you're going back to, you know, when you start teaching Harry Wong. Teachers are the biggest thieves. That's right. Good old Harry Wong. I remember that. <laughs> Everyone had that copy of the book First Days. Yes. <laughs> That's yep. It seems like no matter where you went to college, that was the, one of the first things they hand you, isn't it? That was it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I could go on forever. I know you had some cases too. One of them was related to citizenship. Uh, that Plyler v. Doe yeah. that you wanted to bring up? Plyler in Texas. Because, again, we're talking about citizenship right now, or we're just finishing that up in like my unit because you know, we went back to school early. If you watched the Mr. Betts video, you know he's still on vacation. We did too. Yeah, we've been back for a week and a half. <laughs> but, you know, we talked about, you know, 
like stuff citizens can do because we went through the process like naturalization and all the steps you got to go through and we say why would you go through that you know because only citizens can vote and only citizens can hold you know high level government jobs stuff like that and then i go but what about if you're not a citizen and we start listing things you know like uh, pay taxes you don't have to be a citizen mm -hmm. to pay taxes you know like ben franklin said and my students are probably sick of hearing this by now but you know the only two certainties in life are death and taxes so you know, you don't have to be a citizen to own property because they want property tax. You don't have to be a citizen to work because they want income tax. You know, buy lunch, you got sales tax. So, but, you know, all jokes aside, you don't have to be a uh, citizen to go to school. And I looked at my students, I go, I don't care where you're from, what you're doing here. You're a kid, you deserve an education. So I'm here to teach you. And, you know, that goes directly to Pyler V. Doe out of Texas. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, it the big thing is that education is a right it's an inalienable right i or did they, i don't know if they use that vernacular that exact those exact words but yeah it's it's a right is what the court decided and it was yeah the it started with um i think it was tyler texas was the city mm -hmm. but yeah the um so uh the fact that they had a lot of um mexican immigrants that were going to school in the, the district and uh, they said, yeah, should they um, pay? Um, should they have to pay? Should we make a law where they have to pay for the school? Cause the, you know, they're not citizens. So, which, and that's what started the whole thing. Which is just so. a veiled attempt to kick them out without explicitly saying you can't come here. You know, it's yeah effectively a Jim Crow law. Yep. That's, a, you know, uh, which, uh, the 14th Amendment, of course, as it tends to, it always comes up, <laughs> <laughs> um, equal protection. And uh, the, I thought that, I mean, the fact that this happened in the 80s, and I, I think a, something that people don't realize is um, this was a right around the time that um, illegal immigration started to become more of an issue. Like, there's there are old speeches of Ronald Reagan uh, kind of calling for a more, more open borders, which is kind of surprised, totally opposite of the current administration. It's like they're, um, but they're like, yeah, you know, they're realistic about it. There's going to be, there's lots of people going back and forth across the, the Mexican uh, U S border. Let's just, uh, manage it and deal with it. Um, but then after that, especially it picked up in the 90s, it became more of an issue where it's like we need to be stronger at securing our borders. You saw more politicians that go that direction. So, yeah, Plyler v. Doe is, I think, controversial for some people today, for the kind of the diehards that are all about strict border security. Um, or maybe they're just generally skeptical of immigration I'll, I'll, that's the nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when it all boils down to it, and you're a teacher, I'm a teacher, I, I think we might have a different mindset in this, but, you know, it's not the children's fault. You know, kids come to school no. dealing with home stress, it's not their fault. You know, kids come in here illegally, they didn't travel by themselves. You know, they don't deserve to be punished for their parents. And I think it all kind of boils down to education is a natural right. It's the only way to move ahead in this life. And why deny a child who is not at fault for anything? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's well put. I mean, we should, we shouldn't, uh, they, they are victims, you know, we need to be there for them. doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, the same thing that could be said about the, uh, the other case I was mentioning, Wong Kim Ark. Um, yeah, you know, he, he's what you would call the, the term anchor baby oh, yeah. is rooted in that. Yeah. But why kick him out, you know? And then they kick him out, and he goes to China. He doesn't feel at home in China. He feels nope. at home in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it's never a, a clear-cut case. You know, it's always a gray area. You know, well, you make one claim, but, you know, there's never a blanket solution. And when you try and cause blanket problems, or you put blanket solutions over your problem you're never going to fix it all and if you try to think one case is going to solve you know well he wasn't you know he was born here but he's not really a citizen you don't think of the repercussions you know one step two step three steps down the line and 
I don't know, that gets frustrating, you know, for me personally speaking, that, you know, you can't, you can't see the forest for the trees sometimes. And I don't know. Yeah, it, because that's hard to actually have to critically think to solve the problems, you know, <laughs> whenever you start to see all the nuances, you're like, oh, man, this is a lot of work. And so <laughs> I can't just circle C and move on. It's yeah. Imagine if the Supreme Court justice is like, okay, well, we this is a multiple choice. Uh, we have four, four options where we can move here. <laughs> ah. but, uh, All right, to keep it on a lighter note, can you tell me about a tomato? I know how much okay. I love tomatoes. If we can just... I'm so glad you brought up this case. <laughs> uh, but no, personally, I hate tomatoes. I hate tomatoes so much that I wrote a song called Here's What I Have to Say About Tomatoes, and the only lyrics in the song are, I don't like tomatoes. I swear well, they say, sing that over and over. I'll have to send you the link sometime. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, the uh, the case Nick's first Nick's v. Hedden. Uh, is I totally it's been so long since I made the video. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, it sounds right to me. I'm okay with that. Okay. Uh, it's, but it's it is silly. Yeah, the 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 question is whether or not tomatoes are fruits or vegetables. This is a true story. The Supreme Court actually decided whether or not they were fruits or vegetables. <laughs> Did you, uh, do you know all the details about the case or the, I know, the, I know a decent just, amount about it just because the fact that, you know, the definition clearly says tomatoes are fruit because they have seeds. So you mm -hmm. can't argue the definition scientifically. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> go ahead go ahead i'll, I'll let you i'll, I'll jump oh. in after okay yeah yeah the, the court was like we know that scientifically they are uh, considered fruits but um because so many people have this false belief that they're vegetables um we're gonna acknowledge that and uh because you know <laughs> like people are making money off of it and that's how they're using the, the meaning and so we have to the fact that all these people are you know participating in commerce with it we have to recognize that well it kind of ties into what we said earlier about the government collecting taxes you know yep that's why that's what started the whole thing was the taxes on tomatoes yeah because they're uh i believe it was a tariff because they were, yeah. they were imported from like the caribbean countries right not that's right. Yep. Well, it's it's interesting. I brought this up. I did a video over the summer, and I'm sure nobody has seen. I think it has like 18 views total because I don't get any views in the summer. But I was reading one day, and I read about the Salem Tomato Trial. Now, when I say Salem, you probably think you know Massachusetts, which is all that good stuff. But this was in Salem, New Jersey, which is you know ironic that you know the case you know Hedden is in Jersey, right? But this guy, Robert Gibbon Johnson, who was a, uh, I can't remember if he was a Revolutionary War veteran or at least of the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, he was a merchant and he traveled and he brought tomatoes back to the United States, but nobody would grow them because they had the stigma in Europe of being poisonous and nobody wanted to eat a poisonous plant. The, the only people that grew tomatoes were actually just growing them for the flowers, you know, the yellow flowers on a tomato plant. So he's like, well, but I, you know, I could sell these to people if people would buy them. So he tries to have a contest, you know, grow the biggest tomato, win a prize. And he goes, all right, this isn't working. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a bushel of tomatoes. I'm going to go down to the Salem County Courthouse and I'm going to eat a tomato. And he publicizes it. He gets a big crowd out there in front of him and he eats a tomato. Like just bites right into it. And the crowd goes, oh, they gasp and they think, well, maybe it takes time. So he finishes that tomato, starts the second tomato. And then he just keeps going. And he eats, like, I don't know if how big his bushel was. I don't know how many tomatoes. I, don't, I didn't read that. But he ate a ton of tomatoes, basically, and nothing happened to him. So he kind of dispelled the whole, you know, oh, my goodness, tomatoes are poison. Don't eat them. But they came out and said the reason people thought tomatoes were poisonous is because only the wealthy in Europe could afford them. And the wealthy ate almost exclusively on pewter plates. And the acid in the tomato would leach the lead out of the pewter. And people were getting lead poisoning uh, from eating off their pewter plates. So that's my little bit of wow. crazy trivia for the night. Yeah, that's a good story. I that's a good video idea. I need to watch what you put together <laughs> there. I mean, tomatoes are everywhere. 
unfortunately for right. you, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do like tomato soup though. So really, that's the one. That. I, that's the one thing I don't like. I really, I'm not a fan of tomato soup. Grilled cheese, tomato soup was never really a thing for me. Oh, I love that combo. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I gotta ask. You know, is there any other case that we should know about? I mean, uh, I have to ask you this. You know, before we ask any specifics, have you heard the podcast More Perfect? In fact, the um, one of the producers of the show reached out to me and said that uh, she liked my what I was doing and with my channel and then that she l listened to some of my president songs and I was like, I, I was totally geeking out. I was like, Whoa, I love your podcast. <laughs> I'm not going to so, lie. That's how I feel. Like when I emailed you, I really didn't expect you to email me back. And that was like kind of my reaction. Like I got a little jittery. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's nice. Nice of you to say. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that podcast, like I share that with everyone I run into. They ask, Oh, what podcast you listen to? I go more perfect. And I go, but there's not that many. I go, just listen to it on replay, you know, because, oh, my goodness, the gerrymandering episode is probably my favorite. It's coming back. They There's a new season. Um, they have a new season coming Because they did the album last, and, oh, my goodness, I'm, that's, yeah, that was good. That one was, a, it was good. Um, I like the, the ones better of the Supreme Court cases. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, let's see. Yeah, it looks like it must be just a preview. I was going to say, I just checked tonight just to see if there was anything new, and I didn't see any. Yeah, must have been. Maybe it's coming later. But yeah. But yeah. Well, anyway, sorry I interrupted you. Ah, what, what, what were you saying about it? I was just gonna say like some of the cases that are out there that you know. Again, I'm on. I have my middle school pacing guide, and you know, I have my list of cases that I have to talk about. You know, I I only get a certain amount of time to share with the kids, so I squeeze in. You know, all right, we gotta talk about this, but this is how it relates to that, and I. I you know, there's so much out there. And, I, you know, it's funny now because I, I taught U.S. history for years and, you know, civics was never really a thought in my mind. And here I am now teaching civics, realizing how similar it is to teaching history, where I always tell the kids there's so much more than you know. You know, you, the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. I go, stick with me, kids. <laughs> we're going to get through this together and we'll figure this out. But there's so much. Yeah. There, I know. I'm just... I've only, uh, I just checked, I'm, I've made 48 episodes of Supreme Court Briefs, and I have a list of that's three times that long of videos I want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I could go through that list, like the ones that I really want to make. Um, All right. I mean, because everybody can kind of see what I've already done, and uh, yeah, let me open up that. I Because I, uh, part of the reason why I probably want to say this right now is because, well, Maybe somebody else can make the videos, so beat me to it because we need these – because there's all these great stories, and it's just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I want to say about the Supreme Court that's really important is that because Congress has not been as productive in, the, in recent decades you know, as far as progress, a lot of times they're passing legislation that's backwards even. Like it's not moving our country forward so much. Uh, the Supreme Court has kind of stepped in and filled that role. They're, they've been the ones to kind of push us forward. I mean, great example is same-sex marriage. I mean, uh, just five years ago, six years ago, wasn't even that long ago, and uh, that never would have happened so quickly um, in Congress. Uh, and, and so we have – I think that's why the president um, – presidential elections get extra attention that even more than they would normally is because they're the ones who nominate this, that justice and sure the Senate has to approve, but uh, a lot of people are hinging their or putting all their bets on, you know, the, whoever the president will be, will be based on that Supreme court justice uh, nomination. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh. it's a shame that recently in our recent memory, it's always seemed to fall along party lines. Yeah, really an and discussion over you know the merits of someone. It's rather party lines follow suit. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, uh, take someone like Antonin Scalia. He uh, he's kind of notoriously more ideological than other justices. However, one thing that was fascinating that's, that was good about Scalia, who he passed away a few years ago, but he. Uh, he was known as this conservative guy or limited government guy, but he 
he was consistent. So sometimes he would be voting with the uh, the more left wing members of the court, and so he was kind of people just assumed that it was always like oh always conservatives and liberals against each other even in the Supreme Court. But no, even as recently as just a few years ago, that was not the case. And if you look at the past year. Um, justices like Neil Gorsuch, um, he sometimes hops over to the the other side, and same thing with uh, some of the left leaning justices. They do the same thing, and so it's it's not so partisan in the Supreme Court. And the big reason why is because they're not elected. You know, they they can, they can serve for life, and it's that's I think that's refreshing. That's why they wear black. Yeah, <laughs> that's a nice social studies teacher joke there. Um, okay, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the ones that I really want to make that are important that I haven't made yet. The insular cases, that's one that stands out that, uh, that's about, uh, what are we going to do with Puerto Rico and Guam and the other U.S. territories? Mm -hmm. We have, are they citizens or not? Did they get full rights or not? That's, uh, that's one case that pretty much shut that down. Like, were they, nope, they don't get all the rights of citizens. Uh, so I want to make that one. The Swan versus Charlotte Mec Mecklenburg Board of Education, that one is the busing one, about whether or not it was okay to uh, bus students uh, when they were uh, trying to implement integration in the 1970s. I remember dealing, I, was, I lived in Charlotte in the 90s. I'm not old enough for the 70s, but I remember living mm. outside of Charlotte and still hearing like just the domino effect of you know the busing in charlotte it was still a big deal when i was living there in the 90s like they still uh -huh. like city council would debate over you know well we're trying to redraw these lines we're trying to you know expand you know charlotte you know, you know bigger and they go well now what about the school system and then that was a constantly it was every two three years that i lived there like it would be brought up again and they say well but you know we have the uh that was always uptown Charlotte, but you know, what about uptown Charlotte? How is that going to be affected? And that's crazy to think that, you know, 20 years later, that was still a deal. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy. Um, okay. And then there's a, there's a few cases that deal with amendments that we usually don't think about, like, a, like Bailey v. Alabama, uh, was a case for this guy. Um, he, Okay, so there's a law in Alabama that said you could, if you quit, if you broke a contract, you owed your time, you owed your labor. Like if you, so there's a guy that was, he was uh, contracted to work on a farm. He was committed to work for a year or something, and he quit after a month. And he said, oh, oh, you can't do that. You've got to, you got to finish your time. Uh, and he fought that. Um, saying that this is essentially slavery. And, and I, I believe this guy was African-American in the Deep South dealing with this. Uh, so he said that that went against the 13th Amendment. Um, and he lost. He lost that case. So that's an interesting one I want to do sooner than later. Bailey v. Alabama. Then I had one of my Patreon supporters uh, recommended a couple cases, but I don't know anything about them, really. <laughs> Almost, and maybe you do, Olmstead versus the United States and Katz versus United States. Something to do with, uh, I think, it's not technology. It's not oh, it's a privacy, oh. yeah. Like wiretapping phone calls, um, which, as you probably already know, that's one thing now that, wow, it's relevant as ever. We, we just, the fact that my phone's probably listening to me right now, uh, <laughs> I was going to say it. I have my Amazon Echo. You know, it's always listening. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm that's... I, it's, I, I just live with it. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, well, I've got nothing to hide, so what should I worry about? Well, what if you do have... What, like, there's always... I always think my mind automatically always goes to false accusations. Mm. You know, like, doesn't... Just like that. Like, if you could be accused of something that... A crime that you did not commit. And, and then it's they could frame you. Yeah, like you it, said, it's easy to frame. It's just like that. It's scary. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the best way to put it because I mean, yeah, like you said, people say I have nothing to hide. You know, why do I worry about it? But if you think about it, you know, what if you know 
not just the false accusation side, I was just thinking, you know, what if you say something just in passing and it, you obviously don't have the context? You know, how many times yes. have you thought about that? And then not even, you know, you know, maybe not criminal, but someone catches wind of it. I mean, social media is just like the bane of, you know, most people's existence because you say one thing wrong on Twitter and you lost your job. And, you know, we go through trainings, you know, at Osceola County where I teach, you know, for coaching and for teaching where we have to learn about the proper uses. And we learned about the, uh, was it the Saris case? I think that was her name where back in, I believe, 2014, she tweeted out a bunch of just really inappropriate stuff. And then she was, like, on her flight international. And by the time she landed, a couple hours later, a few hours later, she's getting messages saying, you're the number one topic on Twitter because of this. And she actually got fired from her job just because mm -hmm. of that. And, you know, trying to just tell my students that, listen, you put it on the Internet, it's there forever. You do something stupid, it's going to catch up to you. So context yeah. matters kind of doubling back to what we were saying about you know privacy fourth amendment and all but yeah no i mean again you lose that nuance you if you don't have the full picture and that a lot of uh, the outrage you see on twitter today and any social media is rooted in lack of context i mean at so many levels it's like people just don't uh, well I, I think if we were just able to talk face to face it would solve a lot of that those problems ah. you know you can't you can't hear tone of voice or you can't see body language you can't there's so much communication missing from just people going back and forth on social media although they have developed a sarcasm font the remember that oh have oh, they have you seen the spongebob meme where you know no. he's, <laughs> where it's the alternating capital lowercase letters going back and forth and you know oh that's that's, that's right that's 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 what that is. Yeah. Okay. So now we I've seen it all the time. Yeah, we have a way to convey sarcasm now online. So maybe that'll save our jobs one day. Good job, SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I mean, you've hit all the big names I wanted to talk about. Is anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to share? Just pay attention to the Supreme Court. There's a, I mean, my big series before I did this was my presidential election series. And I was like, oh, well, I've done them all now after I did 2016. What, sh what should I do now? And so I chose the Supreme Court because I noticed that it's often the branch that it gets, it's, they're like an afterthought. I mean, um, but they have such a big impact. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes it seems like the Supreme Court is a little out of touch with your average day american but you could say the same thing about congress or the president i mean it's they're older yes they um it's hard to make them hip to high schoolers you know oh, you got the notorious uh, rbg so rbg yeah that's the closest we get but she's sitting there like what is she 87 years old or something uh yeah i mean clarence thomas is about the most boring person ever <laughs> uh they're all pretty boring, really, but they're all smart. They're all thought. They're not um, so one-dimensional. Um, if you really start, like, you can go to the, this uh, website called Oyez. Oh yes. Or Oyez, Oyez, oh, yeah. That's what they say when they first uh, have a, a session. It's called Oyez. Dot. We got org, I think. I think so. But you can hear all the uh, the audio recordings of um, the oral arguments for cases and. If you ever get bored on a Saturday night and you're not listening to this right now, you can check out Oye's and listen to those <laughs> oral arguments, and they are pretty fascinating. I mean, they are thoughtful, uh, you know, well reasoned. They they really do. It's not like they just all have an agenda. I mean, I, I'm. They are really insightful and consider many different perspectives, um, and. You know, at least it's one thing to kind of lean towards an ideology, but it's another thing to, I think, as long as you have, if you can easily explain the other side, you know, because if you, you're, I think we're always going to have some kind of um, back and forth between a conservative, liberal, whatever you want to call it in the future that are going back and forth. But if you, what I'm noticing that's um, kind of in the, the most most of 
most of us kind of are are just kind of yelling at each other and not understanding each other. That's what I'm noticing when you look at the national conversation in, in the United States in 2019, whereas the Supreme Court, they're listening to each other. And it's like, uh, I just think that they don't get enough credit for, you know, uh, their ability to kind of reason through things. So yeah, and they, they make a big impact. So that's my little spiel, but uh, trying to <laughs> promote the Supreme Court. Yeah, pay attention to them. In the day and age when it seems who yells loudest wins, you know they're, uh, the, yeah. they're the Teddy Roosevelts. You know they speak softly, but you know they carry the weight. They do the stick. So you're you're good with the analogies. You must be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take after Lincoln. You know, I'll spin a yarn anytime I get a chance. So. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Beat, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to have a conversation with you. I, you know, I enjoyed it. I can't speak for you, but you know, I feel more enlightened after listening to you talk about Supreme Court cases that I'm not familiar with. So thank you very much for this. Well, thanks for having me on here. All right. So with that being said, we're gonna sign off here. If you have any questions, leave them below in the comments. And you know like subscribe all that good stuff if you need to you know check out other videos if you haven't already click on this to subscribe to mr beach channel and for virtual history 360 i'm mr wade have a good night